Have you ever wondered how, why, and when to establish healthy boundaries in marriage? In today's episode, Liz and I welcome Boone Christensen and Caprina Moore to the show. They share what healthy boundaries look like, why we need them, and how to set them. They even role play common scenarios to help us learn how to set boundaries in marriage. Boone and Caprina own Steps Family Therapy in Spanish Fork, Utah, where they conduct individual, couple, and family therapy. They both performed qualitative research in graduate school on the role of clergy in mental health and relational issues. When not doing therapy or spending time with their two kids, Boone loves camping, fishing, and reading research on therapist development. Caprina loves planning events, writing music, and yoga. They are both consultants for the mental health company Mindless. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Stronger Marriage Connection podcast. We're grateful that you're here. I'm Dr. Dave here at Utah State University, alongside Dr. Liz Hale, our psychologist and, and marriage and family therapist. We are on a mission to bring you the best we have in research and resources and our guests helping us provide you with the tips and tools to help you create the marriage of your dreams. All right, today, I'm super excited. Excited about our guests, excited about our, our discussion. Um, our guest, it's actually unique. We're going to be talking about, the topic may not be unique, but their, mm -hmm. their situation is they're both uh, therapists and both helping us. We, we hear boundaries, Liz. I, we, I yeah. hear it all the time, it seems like, <laughs> right? Respect my boundaries. I hear parents saying it. I hear adult children saying it, even married individuals saying it. So today's topic is all about boundaries and marriage. And here to tackle that topic of boundaries is Boone Christensen and Caprina Moore, uh, a licensed marriage family therapist, and she's a certified social worker. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks so much. We're happy to be here. I, you know, I might also add that they are practicing in Spanish Fork, Utah, which is actually next to where I grew up in Payson. And I saw the Boone. Got his uh, degree at Auburn University. I am also a fellow Tiger. I went to Auburn University for my PhD, so we didn't overlap. But I, I saw that and had to give that, you know, War Eagle um, shout out. Yeah, to those War who Eagle, go Tigers. Yeah, that's yeah, right. War Eagle, like, baby. I never okay. that. You guys, I, I'm, I'm excited. I took a little time to uh, read a little bit about you both on your blog and your journeys. It looks like you're doing amazing things. Can you give us just a, a brief version of your journeys into the areas of, of helping professionals? Yeah, let me go first. Um, story changes every time, but um, I studied anthropology in college and with an emphasis in uh, African agricultural nonprofit development. Um, and just kind of as a resume builder, I answered a flyer on BYU campus about a study in the MFT department and where I was able to go and observe couples therapy sessions and just thought like, what a, what a fantastic way to apply the skill of studying cultures because marriage is always, it is always the blending of two cultures and the creation of a new one. And so, um, and just a number of other experiences that made me not want to go into nonprofit work led me down the path to, to entering uh, marriage and family therapy programs. Okay. Yes. Hey, Caprina, your story. Yeah. So, um, I am one of 10 children. Wow. And yeah, it's a ton. And the youngest three were an adopted sibling trio. They are Mexican and we adopted them when we were living in Farmington, New Mexico. And so that was really my first introduction, uh, my first exposure to the mental health field, because obviously we all started counseling and we had a social worker for the integration piece. And, um, and I just thought, why in the world would I want to do? I mean, I always thought I wanted to do business because my parents always told me I could sell anything. <laughs> um, but then I, I, it opened my eyes that, oh, I could get paid to work with people and talk about real things like the stuff I care about. And so I think that was the seed. And then, um, I met my first husband in college and then just thought I would be a mom. And, um, and then, you know, life happens and I go through a divorce and I've got a young baby and I just realize, you know what, I, I have to find a way to provide for my son and also be happy. And nothing makes me happier than, um, than being in relationship to people as we talk about the real stuff. And so, um, I, 
I shifted direction then and decided, you know, I do want to be a mom and I want to be a therapist and I'm looking for somebody that speaks that language. I'm not going to end up in another marriage with someone that doesn't understand the way that I see the world. We won't ever be a perfect match, but um, but I, I need someone that's invested in this like I am. And so I was on the hunt for someone just like <laughs> Boone. Um, and then after we got married, we decided, you know, he finished his degree and then it was my turn and he did the awesome stay at home dad thing. And I got my education and we have been in practice together for not too long now because I, you know, needed to be other places for a while until we could branch off and, um, and do our own thing comfortably. And, um, and we just love it now. It's, it really is pretty much what we want to do forever. So we feel pretty blessed that we're where we're at. Yeah. Wow. What a story. I, I love that. I love that you're both involved in this, that you both work together. Uh, helping individuals and couples in their in their life journeys. We need more of you. So uh, thank you. Thanks for joining us again. Now, I noticed on your uh, this quote on your blog, it says, in all the messiness, we find meaning. In all the heaviness, we find hope. Absolutely love that. Tell us a bit more about that and what that means. Yeah, so that's, that's from my bio. I wrote that. Um, as I was contemplating, you know, if someone were to land on our website and be thinking, can this person help me? I think I just, I wanted them to know I've been through my own journey. It has been incredibly messy and very painful. And also as I've found, as I've, as I've come to a place where feeling my feelings was allowed, I found the deepest meaning and, um, and I just think that if I can help people learn that they can survive suffering and that suffering actually is part of the healing, then all of a sudden those really dissonant notes, if we're going to use kind of a music analogy here, the dissonant notes that hurt and kind of make you cringe um, can kind of turn into, they can turn into the melancholy and minor chords that actually integrate and really bring depth to a piece. So it becomes something that it's not, it's not causing active pain anymore. It's actually like this really beautiful twist in the song that is your life. It's not all just one happy, like, I don't really like pieces that are just all happy. I, I like the contrast. And so I love that analogy. And to me, my suffering, if I can be brave and lean in and feel it, it becomes the depth to my piece that I Mm, love that. Yeah. Life is messy. Life is real. And I, I think with that, that background, even it becomes much more uh, relatable and you can understand and have compassion and empathy with, with others. I think both of you, um, and helping couples. So, so kudos to you both. Thank and you. some, sometimes Boone and Caprina, you work together. How does that look, please? Well, how the arrangement looks right now is Caprina work two days a week, I'll work three days a week and just be at home with the kids the other days. And that's our favorite thing. Um, I, I love being stay at home dad. And when she was in grad school, she did three days a week. I, or she, yeah, she worked three days a week. Um, and I was home for those days and it was awesome. And, you know, and as, as partners in the clinic, we do, we collaborate on cases and we get each other's views and we process each other's traumas <laughs> as we as we as we work with hard cases and then every once in a while we will plan to to sit in together um to observe and to offer different perspectives on on some of our cases there have actually been times there have been times where i've said you know what i just cannot there is a reframe right here that feels so perfect and i it's not actually my reframe it's boone's reframe and it's his story and so I'll just get him on the phone and be like, can you zip into the office real fast? And he'll come in for five minutes and our clients kind of know the deal. And my clients love Boone. And, um, and that has just been so special. And I really feel it's a unique thing for our clients, I think, to feel like they've got extra care and extra eyes on their case, kind of like you do when you know your therapist has a supervisor, except he's my teammate and he doesn't have to be involved, but he's part of the care team. I just think that's really special. And um, yeah, we love that resource. 
Boy, I, I think that is so great. You know, when we when I walk into a session, I take my gender, right? I take so much of who I am. And sometimes I think it would be such a beautiful balance to be able to have a male gender therapist, right? That male role, rather, um, to kind of balance that out for, for, for both parties in the couple. So good, good for the two of you. You have many specialties, it seems like, Caprina and Boom, when you really bring your your talents together. You um, tackle mental health challenges, a faith crisis, motherhood issues, addiction, sexuality, and, and even more. But when it comes to this term of boundaries, I have to be honest, I don't use the word boundaries very much. I'm probably just using alternative words, I bet. But can you explain what boundaries are in the context of marriage? Yeah. Um, so when, when I... When I'm giving a little bit of psychoeducation to a client on boundaries, um, I like to give them the very simplest formula possible to start out. And so this is language that Boone and I both use with our clients very frequently, especially as we have opportunity to work with families. We tell our clients a boundary is an if-then statement. There are many things that boundaries are not that your neighbor or your mom or social media thinks they are. So let's make it simple. A boundary is an if-then statement. If you do this or if this happens, I will do this. The then in the if-then is always something you can do. And if it's not, it's not a real boundary. <laughs> so um, I'll give one example. Boone's got great examples too. But here's an example of something that is not a boundary. And then we'll do the what is the boundary in this situation. So um um, let's say the mother is at home um, full time. She caretakes the children and also kind of does most of the domestic labor. And so she gets really irked when husband leaves his socks on the ground and she just needs to have a talk with him and says, I have a boundary here. I work all day and clean the house. This is really hard. It's not the part of my job I love the most. And you leaving your socks on the ground makes me really upset. I really need a boundary here. Don't do that anymore, please. Okay. I mean, she asserted her, you know, this, this need to feel respect and via him kind of cleaning up after himself, but she didn't actually state the boundary. She, she shared her feelings that it, you know, upsets her. So this would be a boundary. And I would need to talk with this client about, you know, is, do we need a boundary here? There are some potential consequences or even a potential rupture in the you know, trust or in the feelings of the relationship if you do this. But let's say in this case, we are proceeding with setting a boundary. It would probably be something like, honey, I've explained how I feel about the sock situation. It really, um, I feel disrespected. I know you don't mean to disrespect me. Um, that is how I feel. If you leave the socks on the ground again, I will probably just put them on your side of the bed. Like I'm, I will put them on your side of the bed so that you can take care of them and they're not in my space. That would be one option. There's many different thems we could insert there, but it is something that must be within your power to execute. Otherwise, it's not a real boundary. So that's our template oh. that we have. Okay. There must be a reason why you're telling it, I guess you tell your partner, because I could also just pick up the socks and put them on his side of the bed. Is there a reason for sharing? Must be. So, so I, I guess it's a diplomatic thing to do. Uh, to let somebody know what your boundary is, but the point of the boundary is not to control their behavior. It's not to change anything about the other person. The point of the boundary is to protect your own well-being, right? And stress levels and mental health. And so if you let them know, then that's great. But you take action regardless of whether or not this person wants to hear it, right? Because your boundary shouldn't be dependent on whether or not they're going to listen to you. And if um, I would, uh -huh. and then if I were controlling, like what would what would controlling look like in that situation, Boone and Caprina, versus a healthy boundary? What would controlling look like? What would I do instead, for instance, no. that I don't want to do? <laughs> yeah, this, is where, this is where my mind goes because when I get frustrated, I'm like, how do I make him change? Instead of how do I protect myself from the distress this is causing me? So. A, a controlling version would be, well, so I have to think to myself first, I have to say, okay, the bedroom is right there next to where he always leaves his socks. I think it would not be that big of a deal. And I think I could protect myself from that frustration. 
of the socks being out to just go ahead and grab the socks and put them on his face. So that would protect me. Verified. Great. That's I'm not trying to modify his behavior. He probably doesn't want the socks on his bed, but that's just that is where I can put them. You're not making me do anything. Right. So here would be the control. So the controlling version would be, okay, I'm going to scheme and see how I can modify Boone's behavior. I am trying to control him. So therefore, I want the then, I want my action to sting because I'm trying to kind of behavioral skinner him, right? So I would say, if you leave your socks on the ground, I am going to throw them away. Okay, well, that would be a big problem because I am actually trying to use the fear of him not having any socks anymore to get him to change. And if it's equidistant to the trash and to the, you know, I probably also don't want to spend money on more socks. I'm just hoping that I can modify his behavior. That's manipulative. And that's ultimately not to protect me because there are other ways where I can protect myself that don't insult or, you know, destroy his property. Uh, That's a great example. It's really about accountability, responsibility, respect. I love it. I love or, it. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait one more week and see how many more times he leaves his socks on the ground. And then I'm going to tell him about how many times <laughs> I'm going to keep score and then punish him for his sins. Yeah. Um, like that's also, that's not a boundary. That's yeah. just punishing. It yeah. doesn't, it's designed to try and make me change, but not protect you. But it doesn't protect, it doesn't protect her, doesn't protect me, and doesn't change my behavior because I'm going to dig my heels in and leave my socks in. Yeah, you totally would. Uh, yeah. You totally would. Yeah. And it's not how we want to show up in marriage, right? That's not how I want to be, my husband. Yeah. Yeah. So give us some, I, I like this, give us some effective uh, ways, you know, strategies for couples to set and communicate boundaries with each other, even examples of, of common boundaries that couples might need to establish. Yeah. Can you want to take this? Yeah. Um, so I, I got, um, I got a little list here of, of some different examples. Do you want to tell them where it's from real fast? Um, so this is, this is from a book that I wrote for my clients. It's essentially a collection of all the blog posts uh, called 101 Therapy Talks. And this is from the, the chapter on boundaries and manipulation. So, so one way that people think they're setting boundaries is by expressing a like or a dislike, saying something like, I will not tolerate this behavior anymore, or this is not okay. So just saying something like that isn't a boundary. It's just shame. It's just, it's just letting, well, or it's just letting somebody what you like or don't like, but it doesn't actually do anything in particular to protect yourself. And so like if, if the socks thing is not okay, or me not texting back is not okay, or me hanging up in the middle of the phone call is not okay, then, then an effective way to express that and have a boundary with it is we'll take one of those. Let's say, Let's say I hang up in the middle of phone calls when I'm upset. Um, Caprina might say, Boone, it really hurts my feelings and I feel abandoned when you hang up in the middle of a phone call. Um, and, and if that's happening, then I will only bring up hard conversations over text or in couples therapy. She's saying what she is going to do to, to help herself be protected, but she's not going to make me do anything. Yeah. And I think maybe an important point here is we're not advocating for full time only communicate in boundaries, right? But it's just like, so there's definitely a time and a place for me to just start with communicating to Boone. Hey, I feel abandoned and I feel very hurt when you hang up in the middle of conversations. And then my hope would be that if he's in a decently regulated place, the expression of my feelings would be enough for him to want to you know, modify some behavior. Or, or to start a compromising conversation. Right. And so boundaries really are not like, sometimes we get so excited about this concept. We're like, oh, finally I get to protect myself that we kind of forget the step of, well, do you trust your partner to care about your feelings? If you can, and not everybody is in a marriage like that, but if you can, go ahead and start with that because excessive boundaries, even in this format, does get to feel controlling. And so we, we want to be mindful that that is often the experienced effect of the person having the boundary set on them. And we always have to weigh the pros and cons of, yes, I'm doing this for myself. And this is a potential rupture waiting to happen. And it's necessary for my own protection. So we also don't want to, you know, we don't tell couples, like, 
just become a boundary expert and use them whenever you can. Like it, it really is if the soft approaches don't work first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. Because yeah, I can see someone just listening to this and be like, oh, "Okay, I'm gonna, oh, if you don't clean up after yourself, you don't put your dishes away." Yeah, all these boundaries things instead of this this conversation. But then, if, okay, hey, if you you keep texting this other this other girl, you know, or this other guy, or there's control, or um, you know, drugs, or any anything else, it's like, oh man, you know, we, we've got to set some some boundaries here for for protection. I like the way that you said that it's it's to pre- protect yourself. Is that right? Absolutely. Mm. Um, I think maybe on this note, kind of if as we introduce this concept to clients, um, the template if then, if you do this, then I will do this, doesn't always doesn't isn't always the best language. So there's kind of this there's kind of a more complex or nuanced version that becomes necessary to understand um so that the language can be can also be responsible on the boundary setter's end. So Boone and I were talking about this example um, because it comes up a lot, as you can imagine. So let's just say there is a, you know, a sexual desire discrepancy between a couple. And um, and one of the big issues for, let's just say the husband to not stereotype (laughs) for the husband is, you know, when you have been cold to me all day, because you're having a hard time at work, which I get, um, you know, that's a, that's a hard time for them to want to be intimate at the end of that kind of a day. So we, we, we start dancing around this issue of, well, if you need to feel safe and connected to your partner before you want to be intimate, then we're talking about <laughs> your feeling as the precursor, right? And so if Boone's I should have used the I should have used the other way just so I could speak from the perspective of the person setting the boundaries. So let's just say this is my boundary. I I need to be responsible for my own feelings. And so it wouldn't really feel right to say, if you don't make me feel safe all day by being cold to me, then I don't want to have sex with you tonight. That just would feel like like I'm putting the responsibility of making me feel a certain way on him. And so this is a nuance that we run into with our clients and so the way that we think about that is that I need to hold the boundary with myself. I need an if then structure that I can trust myself to follow through on. That means I'm not putting the responsibility of my feelings on Boone, yet he is involved in the equation and it's good for him to know that. So just like we said, I will still communicate that. It's diplomatic. But I would say something like this, Boone, if I don't feel connected and safe with you by the end of the day and you initiate i i will say no i'm i'm trying to keep myself in a place where i am not engaging in in duty sex with you because i know the consequences of that and i want you to know that i'm not i'm not trying to make you feel responsible for my feelings i am trying to be responsible for my feelings and protect myself here and um and I know that that might hurt. That might hurt tonight. And and if we're both in a good place, I'm definitely willing to talk about that. Right. So I'm acknowledging that I want to also be safe to catch the emotional experience he's going to have when I set my boundary. And it's probably not going to change that boundary. But I want him to know I care that me setting a boundary with him might have been a rupture in our relationship for him. Yeah. I love that example. Yeah, I do too. Can you think of another one, Boone and Caprina, that comes up often in marriage in general or with your clients? Yeah, common can, scenarios. Like yeah. yeah. Um, well, what, what if we just went further with this example? Because I'm also having feelings here. Yes, good point. Thank you. I'm also having feelings. And one of the unfortunate examples that we hear is like, well, if you don't want to have sex with me, then I'll just have to figure something else out. Like what's happening, what's happening in that scenario is I am feeling something. I'm feeling stressed. I'm feeling abandoned. I'm feeling lonely. Um, and like, I'm kind of phrasing this as a, as if I'm taking responsibility for it, but it really is more of a threat. Like I'm going to go look at pornography, masturbate. I'm going to go 
chat online with someone else um, in order to try and break her down, right? And get her to do what I want her to do. Um, and so, so I think it's important for us to recognize that kind of scenario that what's really going on here is I'm having a hard time expressing what's really going on, which is that I'm feeling just utterly lonely and my self-esteem is shot. And the only way that I know how to boost that is through sex. Um, so we can get in a boundary battle. We can get in a boundary battle here. Is that like, well, I'm going to go. If you, if you don't. Yeah. I mean, he can use my language too. And so, yeah. You get tricked. Right. And so that's, it's important to recognize what happens to my boundary if the other person starts to enter a power struggle. Right. So, so what, like, would have been a help, what would have been a healthier way for you to respond then, Boone, to Caprina saying, you know, if, if, if treating me doesn't, doesn't change, I'll probably have to say no. You receiving that, what would be a healthy way of receiving that without doing the boundary battle? Um, so, so chances are I wouldn't get to this point af until after some good therapy where I could say, I, I hear what you're saying and that is really hard for me because after I've had a really hard day of work and I am feeling cold, like what I, what I feel like I need is, is intimacy. I need to feel love and you feel connected. And it's really hard for me when you say they probably wouldn't want to have sex with me in that state. Um, Can we highlight here? So, so if, if you have a pattern with your spouse developed where when a boundary is set, you both expect emotional fallout and you both are prepared to handle that, then you can oftentimes skip the boundary battle because I know he's going to have feelings about being turned down and we we kind of have a system in place and we actually i mean this is actually totally real for boone and i where you know boone will set a boundary with me and i will have a feeling about it i will feel really upset he doesn't you know maybe it's he doesn't want to go to a game night with me because i i front loaded the work on the first part of the day with all of these tasks i was hoping he would do and he did them but now he doesn't have the gas and so he go he goes ahead and says, you know, because I don't feel rested and energized, I will not go to that game night with you. And now I have some big feelings about it. I was really looking forward to it. I don't want to go without him. It's going to change the experience for me. He knows that I am going to be sad about that. And he is ready to repair with me. Maybe not in that moment, even though sometimes it does happen in the moment. It might need to be the next day, but he will check in or I will check in and we will talk about it and I will get to tell him I felt really super disappointed. I feel like I didn't know that I didn't know you were going to I didn't know that that was a trade I was making and I feel really upset about that because I would have chosen differently if I knew it was the chores or the game night and he will hear that and say, you know, that that makes sense. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I hurt you. I didn't really know it was a choice either. It's just kind of the state I was in when the game night came up. And and then we will try and find resolution at that moment. But if he never came back to me for resolution and repair, I would probably be tempted to set a boundary back on him. And it would be arbitrary and it would be to try and control him. But because I know that that repair is always going to come, I don't, I don't even really have that urge. I don't feel the need to well, this is a battle of who gets what. And so I'm going to fight for my half, right? This just doesn't really come up for me. So we'll be right back after this brief message. And we're back. Well, let's dive right in. Wait, can you discuss any... I guess potential negative um, consequences for not having clear boundaries um, in, in a relationship. You know, if they're, and I love this discussion because it's, it's, you know, control and, and I can hear even some couples, you know, listen to this, it's the if then, or if you don't do this, then I'm going to leave you or, you know, you know, t totally taking this out of, out of con uh, context. And you talk about patterns and habits. And I think that couples get into this, 
um, where they're battling back and forth. But if they can really communicate some of this um, and underlying a lot of this, I keep feeling like it's this almost like, like this virtues underneath these strengths of, of virtues of humility, of compassion, of understanding and perspective taking, because I think you can always say the right things, but if my heart's not in the right place, right, then the, the boundary. So it feels like this whole thing, it only works if, yeah, hey, this is a healthy relationship. We're in this, we're dedicated. Um, we want what's best for each other. So t- tell us a little bit about that. Any negative consequences from not having these clear boundaries? You know, well, I think, I think the big one is resentment. Um, because, because if you don't, if you don't have a boundary or you're afraid of having a boundary, you know, something to protect yourself, then it means you're getting hurt. Right. And, and you don't feel like you can do anything about it. Right. So resentment is going to start to fester. Um, like if I, um, if I just said yes to sex every time Caprina asked, even when I didn't want to, then I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel violated. I'm going to feel objectified. Um, and, and that's going to hurt our relationship over time. And that's going to eventually lead to a point where I'm just going to be like, no, and I never want to have sex ever again. Mm-hmm. And don't touch me. Yeah. Um, and so that was, I can't, the responsibility for that isn't necessarily on her because she didn't know what was going on. I just said yes every time. Right? But I was building up this resentment and not expressing it and not doing anything to protect myself. Yeah. I think something that we see very often is, I think enmeshment is very often born of families with very few boundaries. And so you can have a family, we actually see this all the time, um, where everybody is super emotionally enmeshed, but also nobody wants to be around each other. <laughs> because... Because experiencing Boone's distress, and if I think I caused it, is so intolerable for me that I can't say no to anything that he might need, and I will squash all of my needs to make way for what I think he wants, and I will try and anticipate that. And so the experience of being around my family is extremely stressful, and I might not even have any awareness that that's why I dread family functions, because I love my family. I would literally do anything for them. But the lack of protection in my own life makes it very risky emotionally to be around them at all. And so one of the ways that we try and combat that is, is trying this, trying to help our clients understand this reframe of boundaries are so good for relationships because it makes it so that you don't have to feel like you might be asked to jump off a cliff and you could not say no. Right. It's like, no, I, I, I feel like I can protect myself around my family, which I don't need to do because no one's trying to hurt me there. And because I feel safe, I can show up with you being in extreme distress and know that I can be safe. Or, you know, being able to attend and, and hear grievances and make repairs because I know if it gets too much, I can take space. I can advocate for myself. Therefore, I can hear what you need to tell me. Your feelings don't threaten my safety because I don't, I'm not in charge of your feelings. I care deeply about you and your feelings, but they're not mine to change or control. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for clarifying some of that. You're starting to convince me. You're pretty and boo. And I, I get why you use this term boundaries. You know, what advice do you have for couples who find themselves in conflict over differing boundaries, different expectations, and when is it time to see a professional? What advice do you have for our listeners and viewers today? Um, I think my first advice is it's always time to see a professional. <laughs> or meaning it's always time to to talk about it. It's always time to even get help. Um, hopefully you have friends or community leaders or family members that can listen to you and validate your feelings and, um, and offer wise, unbiased perspective. But if not, it's always like it shouldn't hurt to go see a professional um, and and just talk about it. Um, and as far as I think where those conflicts arise around boundaries is a lack of agreement, perhaps on some basic principles. One being that my needs matter as much as your needs. 
my feelings matter just as much as your feelings. Whenever one of our feelings is hurt, we are both committed to sitting with it. Not necessarily solving it, but at least sitting with it. Um, and if something happens that makes me upset, I'm not going to threaten to leave you. Um, because if those things are established and, you know, and we have some experience with you setting boundaries, me being upset, but us still surviving, me setting boundaries, you getting upset and us still surviving, then this doesn't become a crisis, right? It becomes an emotional episode, but we worked through it. And we learned that, yes, we came out of this experience and both of our feelings still matter. Both our needs still matter. And we are committed to helping each other through our feelings. Um, and, and there are some situations where, where it doesn't feel like that's possible. Um, where I might say, listen, if you, like, if you can't, if we can't have sex when I feel like I need it, then this just isn't going to work. Because that's what a marriage means to you. That's what a marriage means to me. Like, then you are not on board with my concept of a marriage. Um, then that's then that's like a hard incompatibility right there. And and chances are that that could be talked about in therapy. Um, but I think those things are really important to us to establish one before you get married, and then to continuously talk about as your beliefs about marriage and relationships develop. Yeah. So said another way, if those are not core understandings of your marriage, that might be the first indication. Okay, I, I think we need to go see somebody to help us get on the same page because boundaries aren't really going to work here if those things are not core beliefs that we hold in common. And then maybe beyond that, let's say you can agree on those, but you're just kind of getting stuck in the weeds with certain topics. My An indication to me that I need to talk about it is that I start recognizing the buildup of resentment and I start feeling that feeling of control. I start getting irritable and, and that lets me know, oh, something, something is building here and I want to stay on top of anything that I perceive as building because I know those things don't just go away. So I would say if a husband or a wife knows, yeah, this is consistently an issue for us and we're kind of surviving episodes, but they keep happening. That's probably a great time to seek counsel. Like Boone said, it doesn't even necessarily have to be from a therapist. I mean, certainly does have to be. Our our mental health helpers are are everywhere in our community. And if the therapist format is the best fit for you, then excellent. We obviously believe in that. But even going and seeking advice from other marriages that you admire and that you want to emulate, you can find wisdom and what's working for them in many different places. And if that doesn't work, we would hope that a therapist would have kind of that extra level of, I guess, maybe um, tools and skills that they could offer. So it's never, I mean, I don't think it's ever a bad place to, to go for help. But we just, Boone and I always like to put a plug in for seeking that wisdom other places because as family therapists, we really believe that the help and the change is already in your system if you know how to find it. We'll be right back after this brief message. And we're back. Well, let's dive right in. Um, switching, well, topics, but keeping within boundaries, uh, I'm just seeking some some free marriage advice here. So our kids, we have adult children, well, 16-year-old and a 19, 21, and 23. So we're talking about like boundaries with, with adult children and discussing those and what works, you know, in a couple relationship, they may be like, okay, well, yeah, they can come, but they can't, you know, bring their dog or they can come or they're living with us. You know, they're still and they're they're adults. We you know what kind of boundaries or expectations um, common tips or, or advice suggestions for parenting uh, adult children and boundaries there. I'm going to duck out of the screen for one second. Sorry. <laughs> um, so so adult children, uh, this one, this one is this one can be a messy topic. Um, and I, and I get these questions a lot. I work with a lot of like middle-aged parents with, with emerging adult children. Um, so we need to recall the principle that, that your needs matter, that it's okay to protect yourself, protect your house, protect your finances, 
Um, and those are all okay. Those are all okay to do. Um, and so we run into a lot of parents run into this conflict of like, at what point do I stop financially supporting my adult child? Right. At what point do I need to kick them out of the house? Um, at what point do I not let them, you know, do their garage band in my, in my garage and, and keep me up at night or let them nail things into the walls? Um, and, and the answer is like, take a look at yourself. Like, what are you actually feeling about this situation? And, um, what would you need to do to protect yourself? And is that aligned with your goals? And is a rupture in the relationship something that you can survive and come away from stronger? Um, so, so I guess maybe we can conjure up some examples here. Um, we just, I lived with my parents for a while from age 25 to 29. Um, saving up for a house in right. this market. Yes. Right. So just yeah. Yeah. To save up for a house That's and crazy. this is going to happen a lot more because, you yeah. know, housing is, is so ridiculous. Yeah. And so, so my parents have a right to decide what to do with their own house. Right. Like, I may not believe that. <laughs> Maybe as a, as a millennial, I might say like, like, no, this is my house too. <laughs> but they're allowed to determine what they believe about their own house. And they might say, then we don't want you to, to, to be screwing things into the walls by right? punching holes in our walls. And I might say, well, that's unreasonable. As your millennial child living in your basement, I think it's unreasonable that you're not going to let me um, uh, punch, punch holes in the walls. And if they're, afraid, if they're afraid of upsetting me, right? They're afraid of rupturing the relationship. They might back off and be like, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You can do whatever you want with our house. And then feel resentful about it. And that's not good for the relationship. Because I don't want my parents building up resentment towards me. Right? But there's something that I think would be more survivable. If they say, Boone, we can't have you living here if you are... If we feel like you are a threat or if we feel like you're destroying our property, then I'll say like, well, I'm gone then. Like, see ya. And I'm never talking to you guys again. That's really hard. That would be a really hard scenario. But when I, if they like in their wise mind are thinking like Boone will probably go out and he'll vent, he'll vent his emotions. He'll process through them. Um, and we think you would probably come to the same conclusion as us that you don't need to like let anybody destroy your property. And if they listen to me and validate those feelings, then our relationship can still exist because they haven't denied me food, water, shelter, or love. They just denied me the privilege of destroying their property. And I would come to that conclusion eventually and our relationship could continue if they are able to listen, validate without criticizing, judging, or anything like that. Yeah. And this is the scenario where the boundary leads to a strange moment. It's when there is not a pattern of, I'm going to set this boundary and you're going to have feelings and then we're going to talk about it. When I feel so upset about upsetting my child, that's so distressing to me that I just really need to convince them why my boundary is like, okay, and right. And I, and that's going to feel really bad to the child for them to be like, why, why do you keep trying to convince me? Why? I disagree. I felt like that was unreasonable. Now it's like that can so easily become an eternal wedge. But if the parents are willing to, are willing to validate that that was a hard boundary, that that was painful and that their child does not agree and that they see it differently, then all of a sudden that kid can feel safe at family dinner again because they're not going to nail me with that, you know, that argument two years ago. That's like, it was actually fine for my parents for me to feel differently. And it's fine for me for my parents to feel differently because, because my feelings are safe with them. And so... A lot of people have the experience where they hold a boundary with the kid 
And then they think their kid will get over it. But if they don't actually know how to therapeutically engage their kid's feelings, their kid will just stay away. And that's that's really painful. And so should we do a short role play? Sure. With it? Sure. You're the mom. I'm living in the basement. Oh, you're always so dramatic when you're seeing yes. things that all of the no <laughs> the no kid would ever see. <laughs> oh, you he's an actor. He's an actor. <laughs> hey, I just I just installed my new TV in the wall. Oh, are you ready to take a breath? I'm surprised. Right. Okay. Um, Boone, I I'm hoping we can talk tonight. I need to go, but I'll be back. I probably need to separate myself first because if I speak in that moment, that it is not going to be good. So. Lesson one, you're, nope. you're taking the boundary of if I'm feeling too distressed, I'm going to leave the room and take some breaths. Yeah, so I'm going to go breathe. I'll probably talk to my husband and be like, what are we going to do? Is this a real boundary? Are we going to like put the flag on the hill here? And then in the conversation that we have later that day, if I've decided, yes, this we are going to we're going to set this boundary, then I would come back and I'd say, Bowden, thanks for being willing to talk. I um, I'm having some feelings about the TV. Um, <sighs> yeah. So there's probably no great way to say this. I, I'm, I'm worried about hurting your feelings. Um, I don't want to do that. I don't think you care. I said, okay. Going, um, your dad and I have talked and, um, and I'm sorry that we didn't do this earlier so that you kind of knew this was coming, but um, we decided that for for you to stay here, um, we have the requirement that you not puncture holes in the wall, that you not mount things. What's the big deal? Like it's 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 a TV, it's cool, and like you guys don't even come down here anyway. So now I can get wrapped up in defending the boundary, or I can recognize that he's dysregulated, and now is not going to be a good time. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, Boone, I. It is a really cool TV. I'm a little bit worried right now that if I try and explain this boundary, I will just hurt you. And I really don't want to do that. So I Thanks for being so considerate. Um, I can tell you're upset. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to give you some space, but I am happy to keep talking about this with you. I'm sorry. <sighs> and then I'm just going to go. I'm going to give him space. And the boundary is not going to change. But when we come back to it, I'm... Hopefully he'll be in an, in a slightly more regulated place where he can convey his feelings. He's still feeling his feelings, but maybe he's not attacking me. If he were still engaging this energy when I came back to try and validate, I would separate myself again because I need to protect myself from that. That wouldn't be good for me. Um, can we show what it looks like for you to get calm with cycle? Yeah, sure. So, so if I what's the big deal? Well, I I just I hate patching walls. It's like. It's like my least favorite task, and I don't even know if they make the paint anymore. I'll just patch the walls. I know. The thing is, I just like it done a very specific way in the texture of the walls. Hey, you can show me how to do that. I, well, I just don't really, want, I don't really want to have to do that. Well, you don't have to do it. I'll take care of it. We can just print in some extra shifts, and I'll pay for it for when I move out. And here I am thinking, like, he's totally, like, he's right. He could probably patch the wall make it look exactly the same but the point is i will feel disrespected and that's not that's not something that my mental health can handle right now and so it doesn't matter that he has the perfect solution because if i'm protecting myself it's about how i will feel and so i just have to be honest with myself that there really is no version of him putting holes in the walls that will feel acceptable to me right now and so i just have to not argue with him so so then if I was to catch myself in that cycle, I would say, Ooh, you know what, Boone? I'm recognizing that I'm trying to defend I'm trying to defend this to you and everything that you're saying, they are good ideas, they make sense. However, um, that's just not gonna work for me and your dad. And I'm really sorry that that's it's gonna hurt. I, at least it seems like it does. So, like at, on the receiving end, this sucks to hear. Like, I don't wanna hear that, but if she didn't argue with my feelings and she didn't uh, like criticize me or call my thinking stupid or anything like I'm that, like, you always push back. You never just take what your dad and I have to say and just like listen. all you millennials just just <laughs> don't get it, right? As long as she didn't do any of that, then this rupture is so much easier to repair, right? 
All she did was her boundary, which was a wall. She didn't spike me at all. And so when, when I'm more regulated, I can come back and we can still be friends. The only thing is I can't put holes in the walls. Not I'm a stupid millennial who thinks I own the place. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Love it. Love the, love the scenario. I mean, it's a common mm -hmm. one. I love the, mm -hmm. the not taking the hook and, and, and it's <laughs> difficult. This is challenging. This, it's not like normal, right? Natural to be able to respond in a calm way or to say, hey, sounds like we need to talk about this at, you know, at a different time still an important issue, but th this is difficult. This is, uh, it takes, man, it takes patience and, and a lot of work, um, to make that work. Yeah, for sure. And staying true to yourself. You know, I never had thought about it in that regard so much. You two have a, a private practice in Spanish fork, uh, called steps family therapy. Tell us a little bit more about that and where listeners can find out more about you and what you offer. Um, well, yeah, we have, we have a little office in Spanish, um, and I know not much, not too much to say about that. We love working here. It is, it is the best job in the world, and it's great to own your own practice. Um, you can find us. Um, you can find us on the blog. The website is just a blog at this point uh, at steps stepsfamilytherapy.blogspot.com. And you can find blogs there and also links to a podcast, which is pretty much the audiobook. It's some select um, chapters and, and groups of chapters from the book that people can listen to for free. Just to remind me, it's Boone's book, and it's basically him reading the blogs from the website and you know the chapters from the book. I mean, mostly he did that for his clients that just are like, I can't, I won't read. I won't I want read. the content. So I, well, I'll listen to something. Yeah. yeah. So that's what is yep and even the stuff today about boundaries is there's an episode like specifically about boundaries i think uh could be very useful um someday we'll get on social media but like we're just doing we just love where we're at right now so like you can search us there but we're not active on there most it's our blog and uh, there's an instagram page called therapy with boone lmft um and there's content on there but we're not putting a lot of new stuff on there um, uh, that's great. We'll put all that in our in our show notes. Yeah, thanks for for sharing that. Before we wrap up, we like to ask all of our guests a couple of questions. The first one is, what do you feel like is the key to a stronger marriage connection? Yeah, Caprina, you want to go first, and then Boone. Yeah. Um. I mean, while I can't say that this is definitely the key for me, I really think the lesson that I learned that makes my current marriage so sweet and so safe is that I have been on a journey to not be afraid of feelings. Um, I'm not afraid of my own anymore. And I'm usually not afraid of booms and that changes everything. It changes everything because I, I no longer have to treat myself as fragile and I know Boone is not fragile, which means we will get through hard things um, yeah, I think just plain and simple, um, I, I no longer have to be afraid of my feelings because I don't think that any feelings are bad and I know that feelings pass. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Caprina. Boom, what about you? Yeah, I think building off that idea that all, I think all people are good, even your spouse and that all feelings and behaviors make sense once you learn enough. And that sometimes you need a professional to help you to help you figure it out, but you will always find the reason why this person is not bad or not just trying to hurt you. Um, so I think there's one point. And then the other thing is, I think developing an individual identity is essential to a healthy marriage. Coming, you know, doing the work to come to feel like you matter, that your needs matter as much as your spouse's. Um, that that is, I think that that is essential. And that your emotions and you know, your behaviors, your dreams, your plans can exist independently of theirs. Obviously, you're, you're coming together to join them, um, but that you're allowed to want what you want too. And when, when you come to feel like that is okay, then it is so much easier to communicate and to compromise um, and, to, and to change and to accommodate for your spouse. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. I've heard that people do things for reasons that make sense to them. So trying to understand, yeah, their, their mindset. It takes, takes time. I love that. Um, and before we wrap up, we like to ask all of our guests a second question. And that is what's your takeaway of the day? What's a, a message you hope our listeners will remember from our discussion today? Yeah. I'm going to go first. So it's not, um, I'd say boundaries are the things you do to protect yourself and keep yourself healthy. They are nothing that you expect anybody else to do anything about. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I like mean, I, it's hard to say it better than that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, can I have the same one? Can I just say it in like <laughs> only a couple? Yeah. Of you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just have to I quote him. Say, yeah. <laughs> quote Boone. <laughs> yeah. Boundaries. When boundaries are about changing and manipulating your partner, they are poisonous. When they are about protecting yourself, they can convey love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Love it. Caprina. Thank you. Liz, what about you? What's your takeaway well, today? It's similar to what these two good guests just said, this darling couple. I think boundaries really are about safety. It's not just my feelings, but my partner's feelings. I just, I do think of a, of a cocoon a little bit when I think of a boundary or fenced in area where we're both mm. inside and uh, it's not about the rupture. It's about uh, making room for both of us. So, Dave, what about you? What's your greatest takeaway from our time together with Boone and Caprina? Yeah, I, I, this has been a great um, discussion. I think that the boundaries perhaps can change. Is that possible over time? Is more understanding and his development and his relationship um, changes still have to have protection, but there may not be boundaries now. We're, okay, we need to adjust this if I have a child that's, that's living at home or if there's a an accident or mental health or struggles or things. Okay. We need to adjust the, the, the boundaries here of what's happening to keep that protection um, in place. So, so thank you. Thanks again. Uh, Boone Caprina, we, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. It was so fun. Thank you. Thank you. All right, friends, that does it for us. We're grateful for your um, tuning in to another episode of Stronger Marriage Connection. We'll see you next time. Then remember, it's the small things often that create a stronger marriage connection. Get connected. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, do us a favor and take a second to subscribe to our podcast and the Utah Marriage Commission YouTube channel at Utah Marriage Commission, where you can watch this and every episode of the show. Be sure to smash the like button, leave a comment, and share this episode with a friend. You can also follow and interact with us on Instagram at Stronger Marriage Life and Facebook at Stronger Marriage. So be sure to share with us which topics you loved or which guests we should have on the show next. If you want even more resources to improve your marriage or relationship connection, visit StrongerMarriage.org where you'll find free workshops, e-courses, in-depth webinars, relationship surveys, and more. Each episode of Stronger Marriage Connection is hosted and sponsored by the Utah Marriage Commission at Utah State University. And finally, a big thanks to our producer, Rex Polanis, and the team at Utah State University, and you, our audience, you make this show possible. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the Utah Marriage Commission.